Uh, thanks, you guys. Thank you. Um, whew. All right. Of all of the paths I could have chosen, like of, all of, the, of all the jobs I could have had in the world, I never would have imagined myself becoming a yoga teacher. Um, actually, had you asked a younger version of me what he thought of yoga, he would have told you for sure, yoga is a joke. And he wouldn't have been kidding because actually the first time I ever was introduced to yoga, it was through satire. The first time I ever saw somebody do yoga, kind of yoga, was on this TV show called Bizarre, hosted by a guy named John Biner. Um, some of you remember the show, some of you may not. You may remember a segment they did, though, with a guy named Super Dave Osborne. <laughs> so every week, Super Dave would come on and attempt some crazy stunt, and every week he'd end up just mangled and broken in the most hilarious way. And the, the producers of the show gave Super Dave these cloth arms and cloth legs just so that when they showed him after the stunt, he'd be like just warped and twisted. Well, they gave the same arms and legs to another character on the show, played by John Biner, who was a yoga teacher slash spiritual guru guy. And he would sit on this platform and just sort of wrap and twist his arms and legs around in the craziest ways. He'd throw his legs behind his head and talk about how spiritual and healthy and enlightened that was making him. <laughs> I remember being, I was seven years old and I was at this speed skating camp and I thought it'd be so funny if I put my legs behind my head thinking this is just gonna be a riot, right? Click, never mind. Click, yeah. <laughs> well, you laughed a lot more than the kids did at the speed skating camp. <laughs> they didn't think that was funny at all. It didn't really deter me, though. I, I kept on doing it. A few years later, I became kind of obsessed with this show called The Hilarious House of Frightenstein. Uh, it was like a Saturday morning cartoon. Almost all the characters on the show were played by a, a Canadian comic named Billy Van. One of my favorite characters was this guy named the Maharishi. So the Maharishi had like a long beard and long hair and he wore robes and he would sit down and say these inane, nonsensical things and try to pass them off as sort of Eastern mystical wisdom. But I thought it was absolutely hilarious and I remember walking to school in the morning trying to make up my own little pieces of mystical wisdom. Another early memory of mine, way back thinking about yoga, is from the 1980s when my grandma actually took some yoga lessons. And I remember asking her, Grandma, what did you do with these yoga classes? I was half expecting her to just kind of throw her legs behind her head and say something crazy. But she said she actually spent most of her time just sitting cross-legged and breathing. I said to her, Grandma, there is no way that's yoga because that's not even funny. These days, yoga does still actually play like a, a big role in my sense of humor, and, and comedy has really informed the way that I practice and teach yoga. Um, I've noticed a lot of students actually giggle a lot in their classes with me, and I, I encourage it. I, I don't tell people to stop. When I think about when I was first learning yoga, some of the postures were so absurd and just ridiculous. I remember being told to do all kinds of different things with my sacrum, but I didn't know what a sacrum was. <laughs> True story. These days, though, yoga is not so much like a joke for me. It's actually, it's my livelihood. Um, I, teach a, I teach a religious studies course on it. And it, is, it has kind of become almost like a, a coping mechanism on the one hand, and on the other hand, sort of a, uh, a way to try to build a better world, I guess. See, I want to be really hopeful and optimistic about the world that we're leaving for our, ki our kids. And I want to feel like the world is actually kind of a, a beautiful, magical place where the best parts of us get nourished and encouraged to grow. A lot of times I don't feel like that, though. And that's really where the coping mechanism part comes in. And I'm not just talking about sort of larger social and economic forces. I'm talking sometimes about yoga itself. I'm often not very optimistic about where yoga is headed. I see trends and tendencies in yoga that actually are playing into and contributing to some of those same factors that cause me despair and make me lose hope in the first place. So what I wanted to do today was actually talk about three of those trends and tendencies in yoga today uh, and talk about how we might better understand those trends through satire. So that means I'm going to be poking some fun at some people. So if you practice yoga and you feel like I'm making fun of you a little bit, I'm really sorry. Kind of. <laughs> okay, so number one is this love and light delusion. The idea is that we're all one and really there are no problems if we just recognize our own essential oneness. 
you know, people with an extremely bad case of this love and light delusion believe that everything is awesome. The only people with problems are the ones that haven't realized we're all one. Now, of course, that's kind of ridiculous. Like, we're not all one. There's a lot of us. There's seven billion of us. And we're all pretty different. Now, I have had moments when I'm meditating or practicing yoga where the boundaries between myself and the world around me kind of get a little fuzzy. And I start to have like a bit of that sense of unitive consciousness. I feel like I'm becoming one with everything. Then I get hungry. <laughs> or my kids need my help with something. Or I have to go to work. At any rate, like there comes a point in time when we need to sort of stop trying to wish away all the distinctions and differences in the world and recognize, you know, there's a lot of different stuff going on. You know, this love and light delusion, it really in many ways is kind of complicit or it works with a lot of these sort of oppressive and exploitative structures in the world. Now, like, I, I don't want to make it seem like I'm against love and light here. Like, I love love and light. Big fan. But, <laughs> I mean, there comes a time, really, though, where we have to recognize there are real differences in the world. So, I mean, it's this love and light delusion that really it, it enables abusive yoga teachers and gurus to enact all kinds of physical and emotional and sexual traumas on their students. It's the same love and light delusion that enables multinational corporations to you know, go and exploit really cheap sweatshop labor in order to produce really sort of cute yoga pants for ultra spiritual consumers. That is not the yoga that's going to change the world. You know, the yoga that's going to change the world really has to be based on confronting our demons and, and, and dealing with privilege, being really open and honest about stuff like race and class, gender and religion. We need to start realizing that our, our strength really is rooted in diversity and, and recognizing that is not a lack of spiritual attainment. <laughs> I'm glad some of you recognize J.P. Sears. If you don't, go check him out on YouTube. He's genius. Just genius. Okay, number two is called the purity bubble. So in the purity bubble, we believe that we can cleanse our way to a better world. People with a particularly bad case of the purity bubble really see the world as filled with toxins, and yoga is a path to try to push or flush some of those toxins out. Um, don't bother asking what the, what the toxins are. I mean, they, they come from everywhere. They could be, they could be from uh, food or from water or from uh, relationships or even from thoughts. The idea, though, is like it doesn't matter where they come from. What matters is that you flush them out, like right now. In many ways, the yoga mat is kind of a perfect metaphor for the purity bubble. In 2014, I, I wrote an article about how mats really aren't necessary for yoga practice. Like, I can do yoga, well, I'm on a mat. But I can do yoga anywhere. You know, I don't need a mat to do yoga. And I got so many comments of people saying, I can't even imagine doing yoga on the floor. Like on the floor, this like filthy, dirty, germ-ridden floor. See in their mind, the yoga mat was actually keeping them pure. Now, I mean, in many ways, I feel like we can, we can come to terms with this, this purity bubble and kind of and pop it a little bit just by recognizing that there really is no distinction between ourselves and our environment. Like, if the environment has a problem, we have a problem. This skin of ours is very porous, actually. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't block you from the world around you. We're all breathing the same air right now. In a lot of ways, we're actually breathing each other right now, which is a little gross. <laughs> At any rate, like, you can't, you can't purify your way to a better world. You know, if you, if you want a better world, you have to actually start cleaning it up. And, and this cleaning up process, it doesn't just happen internally. It's, it's got to happen in, in, in both ways. I mean, you have to sort of work with the world to try to help to clean it up. And I mean, before you ask, you know, afterwards at the after party, I don't have a strategy. I don't have a technique on, on what I would recommend to clean up the world. You know, um, I just have a feeling that breathing air purified by Himalayan salt lamps probably is not going to cut it. <laughs> Whoa, right. All right, so one of my favorites is this return to the golden age. 
when was the golden age? Well, it depends on who you ask. For a lot of yogis, the, yoga na- the, yo- <laughs> the golden age is actually back in proto-history. It was at a time when ancient seers received these mystical, transcendent truths about the human experience and the path to freedom. This path to freedom, or moksha, is what's seen as, for many people, sort of the gold standard of what yoga is. See, yoga, classically speaking, is defined by Patanjali. In a book he wrote called the Yoga Sutras 2,000 years ago, yoga is not an evolutionary system where we're gradually improving on things and getting better and better and better. It's actually an involutionary system. The idea is to go backwards. So in these yoga sutras, Patanjali wrote, it was the second line of the yoga sutras, he wrote, yoga chitta vritti nirodaha. That means yoga is making your mind stop moving. So chitta is your mind, and vritti means to whirl or to spin. Nirodaha means to stop, hey? So the yoga sutras are based on an earlier philosophy in India called Samkhya. And Samkhya has a view of consciousness that's actually quite unlike our typical kind of Western notions of what consciousness is. See, for most Western minds, and I'm just guessing here, I think most of us think of consciousness as having evolved from some kind of primordial soup. You know, there was like single-celled organisms and then weird-looking fish and eventually horses, (laughs) maybe. And then, and then self-conscious human beings, eventually, hey? Well, in Samkhya, the idea is that consciousness was actually first. And all of matter actually evolved from consciousness. All of matter and all of the problems that evolve along with it. And so if we're looking for moksha or freedom, the path is actually to chart that evolution backwards, in reverse, all the way back towards consciousness. Now... I mean, it's a really, it's kind of a beautiful idea, really, this idea that you can make your mind stop moving. So Patanjali goes a little bit further. He gets into these uh, five different ways that your mind stop moving, these five vrittis. So the five ways your mind moves are sleep, memory, imagination, wrong thoughts, and right thoughts. Now, a little thought experiment for you. Um, Who slash what are you? if you're not sleeping, remembering, imagining, or thinking incorrect or correct thoughts. Like, you're definitely not who you think you are. That's for sure. Like, in classical yoga, even correct thoughts are considered to be a problem. So the idea is you're going to have your mind completely just shut down and stop. And that, for me, is... Well, I'll tell you what, I think that the thing that the golden agers are missing is that having your mind stop moving is totally natural. I think people that have never done yoga before in their lives have had their mind stop moving. I think when you listen to really good music, uh, when you make art, when you have sex, when you, sorry, when you... (laughs) I was having a memory. It was a vritti. <laughs> when you go for a walk in nature, or even sometimes when you just sort of stare off into space. Whew. You feel that? Like your mind stops moving. But then it starts to move again. Like wishing for a time when your mind doesn't start moving again is like wishing for brain death. This golden age for yogis is really hoping for this sort of divine revelation to sort of swoop down somehow and to solve all our problems by making us not think. The issue is that not thinking is not going to solve any of your problems. It's just going to make you not aware of them. It's certainly going to do nothing for everybody else who's still living in a world filled with thoughts and all of their implications. So... Like, what do we do? How do we engage in yoga in a way that is actually going to work towards building a better world? Well, something happened to me one of the first times I ever practiced meditation. I was just sitting around and, and doing nothing. And I mean, let's be honest, that's what meditation is. And I was thinking all kinds of thoughts. And then something shifted, and I realized that I was thinking all kinds of thoughts. That doesn't seem like much. It doesn't seem like a big deal, but it kind of is. 
There is a world of difference between thinking and realizing that you're thinking. See, if I start, say I get nervous, right? When I get nervous, my pupils dilate, my blood pressure goes up, my cheeks and my ears turn red. I hope they're not red right now. You know, I start smelling kind of funny. If, however, I realize that I'm having some nervous thoughts, like I know that, then my first inclination is to wonder, I wonder if those nervous thoughts are necessary right now. Like, I wonder where those nervous thoughts came from. I, I wonder, do they even need to be here at all? See, it changes our relationship quite a lot. And yoga can do this. It can cause these shifts in perspective. See, when I'm standing here on two legs, my perspective on, on the world that I live in and on myself is, is a particular way. If I shift, though, and I'm just standing on one leg, all of a sudden my perspective is different. If I take these legs and flip them both behind my head, that's going to change my perspective pretty radically on legs <laughs> and on heads. And it would change your perspective quite a lot on me. <laughs> so how is yoga actually going to do this? How is it going to change the world a little bit? Well, I feel like it's not going to do it. Yoga is not going to change the world by making us all one. Yoga is not going to change the world by cleansing us all of our toxins. And yoga is not going to change the world by returning us to a, a simpler and more like authentic version of ourselves. But yoga can help us to see things differently. Yoga can help us to recognize that really, you know, bigotry, uh, prejudice, chauvinism, these things are not fixed they're, they're constantly shifting ideas, right? They're just moving thoughts. Yoga can actually help. It, it can help actually make a better world. And it will help make a better world by <sighs> making us more open to change and helping us to realize that there are other perspectives. It's not going to give you the right perspective, it's not going to give you any answers. It's just going to open up more possibilities. Like a better world is possible. And yoga can help us to realize that possibility. Thanks. <laughs>